It's been a long year. It's January, Seth. Well, I I stand by my previous statement. (laughs) Welcome to 2021, everyone. We are putting together new episodes for the new year here at Big Picture Science with topics ranging from the science of color to volcanoes to the big upcoming Mars missions and so much more. But first, we're going to take a look at the chaos that erupted at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. In this episode, we spoke to some amazing guests for a discussion about our shared reality and the danger when large groups of people lose their grip on it. But before we kick that off, we'd like to remind you that we rely on our listeners for financial support. And last year, we launched our Patreon page, a new way for you to support Big Picture Science. So head over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and sign up. It's simple, secure, and best of all, you keep the shows coming your way. With a small monthly gift on Patreon, you'll get in return early ad-free versions of each episode and more depending on how much you give. For instance, at $5 a month, $5 a month, you get access to exclusive bonus material. It might be extended interviews, answers to questions, or thoughts on recent science happenings. And at the $10 a month level, you'll get a shout out in the credits of our podcast, although we don't actually shout. Well, I don't know. But at the $20 level, you get to pose a question which may end up guiding a future episode, but at the very least, will get you an earnest response from yours truly. So just go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and check it out. And thank you for your support. Thanks. For those who follow the news, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th was shocking, albeit unsurprising. It was a grim sequel to a months-long narrative that the election of Joe Biden was fraudulent. It wasn't true, but those who stormed the Capitol believed it was. They didn't think they were participating in a coup. They believed they were patriots defending the Constitution. And what happened? You were trying to go inside the Capitol? Yeah, I made it like a foot inside and they pushed me out and they maced me. And why did you want to go in? We're storming the Capitol. It's a revolution. One of the many shocking things about the attack was that it revealed how thoroughly the nation had cleaved into alternate realities, one side offering evidence and the other side refusing to acknowledge it. The construction of separate competing realities seemed surreal, and yet it's not a new phenomenon. In this case, however, it did real harm. So how did we get to this point? How did misinformation create beliefs embraced by millions, beliefs with massive destructive power? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, and in this episode, another in our regular look at critical thinking. We examine how these different realities formed, why people are drawn to them, and the benefit of a shared reality for the future. It's Skeptic Check, Shared Reality. Sure, differences of opinion are commonplace. For example, you might think that government regulation is generally okay, and I might not. Or you could believe pie is superior to ice cream as a dessert, but I could disagree, um, unless it's rhubarb pie. Those are opinions, and you can have different opinions in a shared reality. But what is reality? Well, because we're a science show, we're defining it by the quality of the evidence supporting it. For example, there were no facts supporting the assertion made by former President Trump and echoed by some supporters that Joe Biden didn't win the election. Yet this assertion found its way to the courts where claim after claim was thrown out, where even lawyers arguing cases for fraud admitted to judges that they had no actual evidence of it. This lie, now called the big lie, was a full-blown conspiracy theory, and it gave birth to an alternate bubble of reality, where for some, violence was deemed necessary to reclaim a stolen election. The lies and other misinformation were so harmful that in his inaugural address, President Biden labeled them as insidious foes of democracy. Recent weeks and months have taught us a painful lesson. There is truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and a responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders, 
leaders who have pledged to honor our Constitution and protect our nation, to defend the truth and defeat the lies. We've talked a lot about conspiracy theories in our Skeptic Check episodes, from UFO cover-ups to anti-vax rumors. And even though the big lie took on supersized power, experience has shown that one way to defeat all these lies and conspiracy theories is to determine what fuels them. And now we discuss that with three guests, experts on social media, on cults, and the history of science. Our guests are Joan Donovan, a research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And Lee McIntyre, a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and the author of the book Post Truth. Also, Steve Hassan, a mental health counselor who writes about mind control. He is a former member of the Unification Church and the author of the book The Cult of Trump. Joan, let's begin with you. Misinformation has certainly been out there for a long time. We've even talked about it with you. But you make the case that we're now in a new era of disinformation and in some sense have crossed the Rubicon with recent events. Why do you say that? What we witnessed in the Capitol was what we look for, which is essentially the kinetic event that moves uh, from the wires online, from the wires to the weeds. What are people doing in public space that is different? There's no going back from this moment because social media was organized, used to organize an, inf- an insurrection. That's different from, you know, protests bubbling up and some, uh, you know, community organizer stepping in to use social media to, to rally for justice. We had politician, the sitting president, call for a wild protest that served only his interests. Well, well Lee, you have a book called Post Truth. And whatever the definition of post-truth is, and you might tell us that, how does this Rubicon crossing, which after all, you know, it, it, it was a guarantee of civil war in Rome, what, how do you view this as, as an event that somehow has changed the landscape in a way that can't be repaired? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, in my book, Post-Truth, I define it as the political subordination of reality. But I don't think this is new. Um, I think that the post-truth era that we're now living in and what we saw on January 6th at the Capitol has its roots in 60 years of science denial. And we've just now, the problem has metastasized from the problem of science denial to reality denial. And I think it's because folks were saying, Look, if you can deny the truth about whether cigarette smoking causes lung cancer or whether climate change is real or anti-vax, why not deny the facts about an election or the path of a hurricane or anything else? It's all part of the same thing. This is obviously worse, as metastases are, but it's it's something that's been going on for quite some time. I I agree. I'd like to bring us back to 1928, uh, the book Propaganda by Edward Bernays. And what I've seen is an ever-increasing sophistication of understanding how the mind works, how influence works, how social psychology works. And in the introduction of the digital realm, the gathering of data on people and customizing and algorithms has, has indeed made us live in a dimension that has never existed before. Although, Steve, I believe that you disagree with Lee that we're in a post-truth era. Why is that? I think truth and facts still matter, and I would much prefer the frame of saying we live in the age of influence rather than we live in a post-truth world. And what's missing is for people to have a clear understanding of the differences between due influence, ethical influences, and undue influences. Uh, Steve, I actually agree with you. I think that truth still matters. So when I say that we're in a post-truth era, I don't mean that truth doesn't matter. I mean that truth is under threat. Uh, And so I think it's a misconception to say that we couldn't be living in a post-truth era because truth still matters to so many people. It would be like saying that we don't live in a um, society in which there's institutional racism because we know so many people who aren't racists. It's a, it's a problem. It's a systemic problem. I would guess that we all agree, though, that we do live in an age of disinformation and that it's being heavily 
trafficked. And I want to pick up on a word that Steve said, which is influencers. And Joan knows something about that. Uh, Joan, I wonder if you could just talk about the role of social media in incentivizing these false beliefs and being a powerful influencer and how we think about the world. Yeah, you know, I often talk about disinformation as an industry, which is that there are two different payoffs, which is financial and political. And there is no uh, incentive to circulate the truth online. The truth is very boring. It doesn't have palace intrigue. It's not hot gossip out of Hollywood. And so scandal and lies tend to do well based on the way in which our social media is designed so that Influence can happen either technologically through uh, gaming algorithmic systems, or it can happen through uh, social media personalities, political pundits, um, the politicians who are stunting. And unfortunately, journalists as well uh, play a large role in, in how influence plays out online. And, and if I may jump in and add, Joan, that um, in researching the Cult of Trump book, I learned about fourth generation warfare, which is psychological warfare that was uh, first written up by a mil American military strategist, William Lenz, who then partnered with Paul Weyrich of the Christian right. And so we've been influenced by other state actors like Russia, but also internally uh, by people who are authoritarian, and especially people who want to destroy the separation of church and state uh, to do this psychological warfare on American citizens. And for me, the solution is mass education, like really helping people to discern who's credible as a source of information, how do we know it, and um, and outing the bad actors. Can I say okay. something about the, the fourth gen warfare? Because I think it's an important point, which is uh, in our research on meme wars, fourth gen warfare really refers to the fact that you can't tell the difference between citizens and combatants. And this is really important for enrolling participation uh, over time is that people see this behavior of sharing memes that are uh, just laced with um, lies and, and especially memes around uh, Trump winning the election. People saw that as, as child's play, as kid stuff, as like, oh, look at these boomers, like they don't get it. But fourth gen warfare, when it comes to uh, psychology, is really about the long durée. It's about repeated information that happens every day on every platform that makes you think that um, Trump had exhausted all legal opportunities and now the only way to save, so the only way to save U.S. democracy was to take it by force. But I'd like to just add that my understanding of fourth generation warfare is that as opposed to propaganda to convert people to your way of viewing, it is about delegitimizing truth, delegitimizing leaders, delegitimizing institutions, uh, and creating confusion that sets, sets people up. And in the mind control research, this is referred to as the unfreezing stage of doing brainwashing on people, to disorient people, confuse them, this, get them not to trust, uh, uh, again, institutions and science. Let's talk uh, more about cults, because in this part of the discussion, we are defining this new reality and what's going on right now. And Steve, of course, you've written a book about the cult of Trump, and people may have missed it, but you did mention that you had been in a cult yourself. QAnon has been referred to as an online cult. How did the followers of Trump meet the definition of cult? I describe the cult of Trump as an authoritarian cult that starts with the stereotypical profile of a cult leader, which is called malignant narcissism. So the attributes of a malignant narcissist creates a cult of personality in and of itself. Putting that person in the office of the president magnifies it a billion times. But I define a destructive authoritarian cult as a pyramid-like structure with someone at the top who claims to know everything that uses deceptive recruitment, including pathological lying, and controlling people's behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions to make a new identity that's dependent and obedient. And this new identity in mental health parlance is referred to as a dissociative disorder. 
So in my case, there was Steve Hassan of Flushing, Queens, New York. By the way, I grew up 1.3 miles from Donald Trump in Queens. Uh, there was the old Steve, and then I got into the Moon cult, and Moon and his wife were my true parents, and I had a whole new indoctrination, new belief system, new language system, and I believed the old Steve was evil. And so I was raised as a conservative Jew. Within three months, I was believing the Holocaust was necessary because the Jews didn't accept Jesus. And I had visited Jerusalem. I went to Yad Vashem. I, I was educated. I've, I read 1984 prior to being deceived into the moon cult and my indoctrination. So when people think of people in the cult of Trump as stupid or crazy, I object vigorously. Not that there can't be stupid and crazy people in any massive group, but there's a lot of educated, intelligent people whose minds have been hacked. I, I just want a quick reaction from Joan, because you've heard what Steve has described uh, as his experience with the Moonies. But, you know, you're saying we've crossed the Rubicon. Julius Caesar was going to try and do exactly what uh, Sun Young Moon did and establish himself. I mean, is there anything new here? I think the main thing is for a sociologist is that we uh, we focus less on the individual psychology of what what happened and more more at the the structures of our communication system that fomented this kind of community and this set of beliefs that uh, really fed on breaking news uh, that then reincorporated all of these stories like Epstein didn't kill himself uh, this idea that uh, Clinton and others were part of this massive conspiracy to overthrow Trump. All of those ideas were left unchallenged online and really were reinforced by the system as it is designed, reinforced by community responsiveness and little Facebook groups. And I think it's important that we think about how Facebook is a very mundane place where we might go and get information about a yard sale. It's the same place that you would get massive amounts of misinformation day in and day out. And it's that everydayness of the technology that was incredibly disarming for a lot of people. Uh, this is all so fascinating to me because there are so many analogies in what's just been said about cults and science denial. Because so many people these days get uh, speak of uh, conversion into anti-vax or conversion into flat earth. And they're radicalized by YouTube videos where they go down the rabbit hole. That's even the, the language that they use sometimes. Uh, uh, flat earthers tend to love the movie The Matrix. They don't see it as a bad thing to go down the rabbit hole. And then they'll go to a convention, which is where the real indoctrination begins to take place because it's one-to-one -one and you're surrounded by your peers. Um, so I, I'd really be, I'm really interested in this question of the distinction between a cult and a belief system that's a denialist belief system because you know where where is the criteria here is there a distinction i i would argue yes <laughs> oh, okay Be because because sometimes i think you have to look at the examples and i would add that i studied isis recruiting online and they were doing swarming when i was in the moonies we were doing love bombing that was in person but they were doing swarming online and it had the same effect okay the the contemporary literature on science denial might be quite fascinating uh in comparison to some of the things and i'm reading your book now steve on the, the cult of trump and i and i keep marking things in the on the pages having to do with the strategies that are used by uh, science deniers, because it's important to re remember, and this goes back to something that Jones said, this information is created intentionally. This is not a mistake. This is created by somebody who's got an interest at stake, whether it's ExxonMobil about uh, climate change or, you know, that, that's, that's where it comes from. And so when we're, you know, when we're talking about how it's done and how to fight back against it, which I know we'll get to, We've got to draw this distinction between the people who are creating it and the audience. And so the people who are creating it, uh, and again, Jones said that there's financial and political interests. Some of them are foreign, some of them are, are not. There, there are people who benefit from science denial in the same way that there are people who benefit from the creation of a cult.
You're listening to a discussion about how misinformation, when promoted on social media, can warp the perception of reality. And we'll have more in a moment. This is Skeptic Check, Shared Reality on Big Picture Science. I gotta say, Molly, it's pretty scary how many people get involved in cults. Yeah, but are you sure you're not involved in one, Seth? Like Steve said, even well-educated people are susceptible. It's motivated in part by emotion and a sense of belonging. Hmm, well, I wonder whether we'd get more Patreon subscribers if we operated like a cult. I mean, just tell them that we can't do the show without them and that they should join us at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience to earn rewards. We already do that. But I think we need a charismatic leader to be a cult. Too bad about that. Well, still, the rewards offered on Patreon make it pretty alluring. For only $5 a month, Patreon supporters get access to exclusive bonus material. Our discussion about the challenge of fighting misinformation was too long to fit into this episode, for example. So Patreon subscribers will get to hear some of what got cut out. Yeah, namely our conversation about the so-called plandemic a conspiracy theory which held that COVID-19 was created in a lab. So join us on Patreon and you'll be able to hear that, as well as past bonus clips, including a eulogy for the Arecibo Radio Telescope, extended interviews with guests, and a discussion of the monoliths, remember those, that mysteriously appeared and disappeared last year. (laughs) Just go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and sign up. It's quick, it's easy, and most important, keeps Big Picture Science in production. And thanks for your support. Thank you. We continue our discussion about the forces, especially social media, that can define reality and how effectively they do so. This is evidenced by the disparate beliefs about the recent presidential election. Our guests are media expert Joan Donovan, historian of science Lee McIntyre, and mental health counselor Steve Hassan. There have always been separate realities. Um, there have been separate realities for centuries, and we accommodate a lot of people's um, alternative realities because we're all living in them to some extent. And So this may seem like a a funny question to ask now, but how do we know when an alternative reality is a problem? Do we have a way of identifying that? When it interferes with people's functionality. The interesting part here for me is always to compare it to how scientists think. And Steve, you talked about testing, and I, I naturally think of evidence here. But the problem is that a lot of the folks that we're talking about in either cults or science denial or you know, post-truth era, whatever you're talking about, uh, believe in conspiracy theories. And when it's a conspiracy theory, they don't need evidence. And the interesting thing about conspiracy theories is they have this double standard where if there's no evidence, then it shows just how good the conspirators are. And if there is evidence, you know, even the sketchiest stuff, well, they can, you know, draw a, uh, connect the dots and draw something together. So the problem is what sort of evidence could actually talk them out of it? And when I've uh, spoken face to face with science deniers, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the uh, Flat Earth Convention in uh, Denver. um, And I asked them, and they claim that it's all about evidence, that it you know, doesn't have to do with faith or ideology, that it's all about evidence. And so I would ask them that question from Karl Popper, what evidence, if I had it, would convince you that you were wrong? And they couldn't answer it. And then I just didn't interfere with the fact that they were very uncomfortable with the fact that they couldn't answer that, because if it was actually based on evidence, then they should have been able to. But ultimately, they are conspiracy theorists who think that you know all of the evidence that I could share with them has been manufactured uh, by people who are against them. Lee, in order to understand the universe of post-truth, we need to know where it came from, and you trace it back to big tobacco. Uh, can you give us a brief summary of why you do that? 
Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway wrote a terrific book a few years back called Merchants of Doubt, in which they tell the story about how the tobacco companies were hair on fire worried in the 1950s by this scientific study that was going to show this link between cigarette smoking and cancer. And they brought in a public relations expert who said, you need to fight the science. You need to do some public relations, some advertising, uh, maybe start your own scientific pushback on this, you know, hire some scientists to say what you want them to say. And this was a wildly successful campaign that became the blueprint for science denial for the next 60 years. And what I noticed um, when the problem of post-truth really started to, to rear its head, uh, was named uh, post-truth was named the uh, OED word of the year in 2016, is that this was just a continuation of what had been happening with science denial. It was the same strategy, it was the same tactics that had been used against climate change, were the ones that used from the cigarette companies, and then they were used again in the, uh, the political realm um, to make arguments about the path of Hurricane Dorian or how many people were at a, a presidential inauguration or uh, whether an election was framed. Joan, what about this? I mean, there's an implicit assumption here that science is a good arbiter of truth. Is, is that generally accepted? I mean, given the science denial that Lee has just discussed, maybe science is the wrong thing to which we should appeal. We have to make a big dividing line between what counts as science and what is market research. But um, as someone who's been in this field uh, for a while that has worked and strived to stay independent, we have to realize that there's a lot of different ways in which science is corrupted by the industry forces that are really trying to protect their stock value. And uh, Naomi Oreskes' research on this, I was a student of hers at UC San Diego. And, um, it, it, you know, even as she was trying to uncover this, there were active attacks on her and her personality. They were trying to get her blacklisted from these meetings. Ad hominem and, attacks, right? And, and that, w that was really important because the people who are striving to create knowledge then become uh, fodder in these in these industry research reports who try to discredit them. And so it's not the case, though, that we haven't had, you know, battles around science, and but it really has to do with credibility and the way in which we assess credibility. And when a research field is flooded by industry research, it becomes really difficult to parse truth from the lie. Then how did how did social media become such a, a problem? Because it was supposed to be the solution, right? Like you have social media, the truth would out because the truth tellers would be on social media presenting the verifiable facts, but that's not what's happened. So when the internet first started, it was a great boon to my work because part of the issue was information and how to share information about particular cults how to give voice to former members who had insider information. So we were thrilled. But over time, money and power wins. So they were doing SEO manipulation. They were taking down our, hacking down our websites, etc. And now we're lost. Now Wikipedia has been taken over by destructive disinformation and cults. And I should add, I'm horrified that I heard F Facebook is using their AI algorithms using Wikipedia to determine stuff. Yikes. Steve, you've written, you were in a cult, you were in the Moonies, you left the Moonies, and, and we'll hear how you were deprogrammed in, in a moment. So I want to get at what the appeal is of some of these streams of disinformation. But then I'm very intrigued by the fact that you write that it's very unpleasant to be in a cult long term. And maybe we'll start with that. Why, why is it unpleasant to be in a cult? Because your real self is being suffocated and constricted. You're being alienated against your own thoughts and feelings, turned against your own family and friends. I was a creative writing major in college. I was, I was told to throw out my poetry, all my original work, as a demonstration of my commitment to God. Um, I was sleeping three to four hours a night, working seven days a week for no pay. Do I need to say more why it was unpleasant? <laughs> of course, 
I was believing I was saving the world and the Garden of Eden would be created. This beautiful fantasy is a big allure of saving the world, but also cults appeal to meaning, uh, you know, who are you? Are you living up to your full potential? Uh, we can help you, but also helping others. So there are universal appeals and human beings go through life cycles, uh, events, where they're more vulnerable. Right now with the pandemic and the economic problem, we're all vulnerable. But prior to that, death of a loved one, illness, divorce, losing a job, graduating, moving to a new city, state, or country would make people more susceptible to somebody saying, you seem really wonderful. What are you doing with your life? We think that you have potential. There's more that you can do to help others. And it is very attractive. So telling you what to believe and having that information come from a person, there's a focus on the leader of the cult, is something that they all seem to have in common. I, I, I guess... need to interrupt you, if I may, and just say there's an incremental lying thing that always happens where you don't even know what the group really is at the beginning. They're finding out information about you, and they're feeding you incremental changes in behavior, thoughts, and feelings. Um, so it's it's crucial that so I didn't even know who the Messiah was for three months. And I had already been persuaded to drop out of college, quit my job and donate my bank account. Lee, while many of these misinformation streams are on the right, you've written that it was actually academics on the left in the 20th century that challenged the notion of reality, what constitutes reality, and that may have set us on this course. Can Can you explicate that a little bit? Yeah, um, in my in my book Post Truth, I have a chapter making the argument that postmodernism uh, set the table for some of what happened with a post truth later. It really comes down to two different theses. Uh, one is the idea that there's no such thing as objective reality, um, and the other is the idea that anybody who makes a claim of truth is really just asserting their power. Once you have those two theses, which are you know very interesting in the, the use that the postmodernists uh, made of them to critique science, uh, although I, th I think that was illegitimate, the critique they made uh, in literature. It's also ripe for exploitation. Uh, and what happened is the postmodernists were on the left, but they created these tools that were then uh, taken over by people on the right and used for purposes that the left just could not stand. And I think that's why I get so much hate mail on this topic, because they just can't stand the idea that they created these weapons that they then see in the hand of the enemy. So it's like when we sit around and say all truth is relative, it's actually a, a dangerous concept. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's easy to say that sort of thing when you're at the seminar table, and it's not so funny when you're in the lab. And what happened with uh, now postmodernism uh, had some offshoots, and one of them was uh, the the science wars, the people who were attacking uh, from the humanities departments who were attacking uh, the sciences and claiming that there was no such thing as objective reality, that scientists were just asserting their uh, their political thoughts. And you know this was this was a scandal, and it was a war. There were you know there was aggression on both sides. But my point is that the scientists had to defend themselves from the claim that they were not actually interested in truth or discovering reality. And this you know was terrible from my point of view. And I think social media really undermines the value of debate uh, around truth because it removes context entirely. For the last four years, I've, I've fought tooth and nail to get more context added to social media. And unfortunately, it's taken, uh, you know, way too many, you know, lies in order to demonstrate that lies have a corrosive uh, effect on our, not just our democracy, but our capacity to relate to each other in a community. You're listening to a discussion about the forces that can dramatically warp perceptions of reality. And it's a lot to process, but stick around for the final part of our discussion when we consider how to tackle this problem. It's our regular look at critical thinking, skeptic check, shared reality on Big Picture Science.
We've been talking about how misinformation amplified by social media can lead many to hold beliefs that are not supported by evidence and the damage that results. We've identified some of the factors that shape these realities, such as social media, cable news networks, politicians, and even cult-like authorities. Unchecked lies and misinformation were called out by President Biden in his inaugural address as a threat to democracy. So we've covered a lot so far. And now in the final section of the show, we discuss what might be done about it. Solutions. And once again, our guests, mental health counselor Steve Hassan, historian of science Lee McIntyre, and media expert Joan Donovan. Well, Joan, we'll turn to you and talk about the problem that is social media and the social media companies. And you've written that after Charlottesville, they tried to control bot abuses and they tried to control hate groups. I'm wondering if they did enough then and what they need to do now. So let's just cut to the chase. They didn't do enough then. And the problem is also lack of coordination between these companies, which is to say that when they do take action on one platform, it tends to create problems on others. And so we do need a a kind of early warning system that allows these platform companies to coordinate without it being considered antitrust. Uh, And so that's one of the big barriers to coordination of Uh, removing these notorious and patterned uh, disinformation campaigns. I wonder if we can also talk in specifics, though, if you can just give an example. Is it that word? Uh, Is it certain words, ideas that should be removed and should they be removed? known years ago when Alex uh, Jones was using platforms to both sell his uh, supplements and spread disinformation that it was immensely profitable and and incentivized by growing audiences and failure to look off the platform for harms, you know, has made Facebook develop this concept of quote unquote, real world harms. And my brain just, it doesn't compute because real world harms, like what is the other kind of harms that they're willing to tolerate? And I would add uh, Alex Jones, repeated at least 1,000 disinformation stories from RT TV that then got picked up by Breitbart, then got picked up by Fox, and then went to the mainstream media. But is it not true, Joan? You know, Facebook has like a third of the world's population is involved with Facebook. That gives it a lot of inertia, right? And to think that they're going to be able to police their own product it's, it's like maybe saying, you know, Plato's allegory of the, the shadows on the cave walls. Who's going to referee what's true and what's not true? Is, is this not a fool's errand to assume that these platforms will somehow be able to rein in the non-truths that are dangerous? I firmly believe there's no communication without misinformation. People are going to be incorrect, especially in the midst of breaking news events where we're all throwing ideas into the same pile or a hashtag, right? That's not the point here. The point here is about thinking in a tiered model of amplification to say, well, when you're reaching 50,000 people, then there should be some oversight. When pieces of content are reaching 500,000 people, just like our old radio models, you have different sets of rules that you must abide by. And if you don't, strike, strike, you're out, right? Uh, you know, this is, there There are ways of doing this. On Twitter right now, uh, if you violate their civic integrity policy, uh, you get five strikes, a uh, different form of baseball, but an improvement nonetheless. Trump had, you know, what looked to be about 200 or so uh, strikes about claims about election fraud before we got to the chaos at the Capitol. Reddit was very successful at removing QAnon early and hmm. early intervention matters in terms of trying to turn it around for some of these folks. Well, as we look at solutions, there's another area that we should talk about a little bit, and it's really the social. <laughs> We're taking the social out of social media and actual social relationships back in the good old days when we had them in person. And everything that I've read about how we try to move out of this area of misinformation calls upon face-to-face relationships, relationships with our friends, relationships with our family. And I wonder if we could talk about that. I know, Lee, you think that's particularly important for scientists. And what is it that you're advocating? So there's, um, my new book is called uh, How to Talk to a Science Denier. 
And I was intrigued by the fact that the anecdotal literature tends to show that when people are converted out of denialist beliefs, it's always on the basis of a trusting, engaging personal relationship with someone who brings them out of it. And it occurred to me that it might be the exact same way with science denial. And so that's what my book is about, going out and actually trying this. Jonathan Swift said that you, you can't reason somebody out of something that they didn't reason themselves into. So you can't just provide them with facts or evidence. You have to get them to trust you. You have to get them to, in a way, change their identity based on their identification with this new relationship. And then they can be brought out of it. I totally agree. And if I can jump in what I've learned over four decades of intervening with people who've been radicalized in all types of extremist groups is this very point that the best way to help is to educate their family, their friends, former members, and introduce them to, you know, teach them strategic communication techniques and, and bring them the person back in time before they got radicalized to remember what their values were, to remember how, how good it is. And what I've been imploring people since Trump came into, into uh, power is stop cutting off your family and friends who are Trumps, Trumpers. Stop calling them names and stupid. Uh, and you can limit the amount of, of fire hose of propaganda they're sending at you to convert you. Say, listen, I love you. I respect you. You're intelligent. I'll believe if there's evidence, let's take it one step at a time. You share something, we'll discuss it. I'll share something, we'll discuss it. And it's this personal relationship that really helps repersonalize people. Steve, if I could ask you, you were you left a cult, you were deprogrammed. Uh, we talked about the role of family members and friends and bringing people out of a stream of misinformation. How did you step away from the cult and what was the role of the relationships between your friends and family in, in doing so? So you're asking me to go back to 1976, but I'm happy to do so. But this world of digital media is so different. Um, I agreed to the deprogramming, not because I had any doubts at all, consciously. I had lots of them subterraneously. But because I wanted to prove to my family I wasn't brainwashed and I wasn't in a cult. My father cried and said, what would you do if it was your son who disappeared and joined the controversial group? How would you feel? And it forced me to step into his shoes and I could see he genuinely was worried about me. So I wanted to prove that I wasn't. So I agreed to five days. The thing that broke through for me was when they handed me one of Moon's speeches and asked me what I thought of it, I read it. And Moon was lying to an audience of congressmen and senators about how much he loves America and how surprised he was that Americans could imagine that a Korean could brainwash them. And when I read it, this was 27 months of indoctrination, I thought, what a liar. Because I had heard him personally say over 100 times how stupid Americans were and how the Koreans were the master race. But as soon as I allowed that doubt, it was like a house of cards going blah, 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 blah. You know what I like about that is it sounds like while lies can accumulate quickly, maybe doubt can start to accumulate quickly and critical, and critical thinking. But having time away from the group was important. Like right now, one of my biggest challenges, because I have families who hire me, is how to get the cult member off their smartphone because they're constantly being influenced throughout the day. They're constantly being monitored where they are. And the critical thing is you never attack the cult directly. If you attack the leader, the doctrine, or the group, it sets up the thought stopping and the phobias and the, entrenches the person. But the problem here is what I'm hearing is that, okay, we'll use the old tools to solve the current problem. I mean, we've been trying for decades, right, to solve the problems of people who do not believe in evolution or vaccination, right, or climate change and so forth. You know, just get to their friends, their peers, their, their, the members of their church group, their synagogue, whatever it is, and that will work. 
But, you know, there's a certain basis anti-intellectualism in the United States. That's not new. That goes back hundreds of years. Is, is there some new approach to any of this, Joan? Um, yeah, I think we actually need to think uh, in bigger and bolder models for getting the web we want, uh, which is to say that the reason why we get here is because of there was such a receptive audience and community for people to discuss these issues. And one of the fundamental features of social media seems to be that it moves the fringe to the mainstream. And it does it incrementally, it does it over time, and it does it by assaulting people's sensibilities about what counts as authoritative information, which is to say that if um, you believe that Rudy Giuliani is a real lawyer that is making real efforts at uh, doing 60 some odd court cases uh, in order to- to That failed. I couldn't yeah, help but they were say all that. failed court cases, but <laughs> online it was marketed as the the courts wouldn't listen. The courts were the problem, not the fact that this was performative litigation designed for social media engagement. And so we need to hold to account the people who are benefiting from the system as it's designed. And then we also need to think about descaling platform companies, especially as we know now that uh, the same kind of mundane technologies that are going to connect cat lovers are going to also connect insurrectionists. And so we need a, a kind of oversight. I've advocated um, uh, very plainly for let's get 10,000 librarians on the job and like get them to think about curation of knowledge online so that when you Google something like, you know, where did COVID come from? You don't get Steve Bannon's lies. Well, let's provide the carrot then. We're all talking about how we might get back to a shared re reality either through um, regulating social media, having connections one-on-one. -on -one. What are the benefits of a shared rea reality? How does society benefit by having a, a greater shared reality, consensual reality than we have now? Pe people don't die of COVID unnecessarily. How about that? I mean, the, this, this is part of the lore we've often told ourselves about just the nature of news, which had some really problematic gatekeeping functions that that did make it hard for uh, people of color, queer people, other people to be represented in our media. And the internet provided in some instances an on-ramp for independent media, you know, the, the design of the internet before platforms actually promised us better and more local news. Everyone would be able to make a website and cover their city council. But what social media has been able to do is harness those intentions and centralize and concentrate power and then hand the keys over to politicians and marketers and celebrities. And, and so I think that um, in some ways we do need a return to uh, decentralization that would allow for multiple voices to flourish and then uh, that, to me, would be contributing to a purpose-built and intentional shared reality where there are things we can agree on and there are things that we will disagree on but then try to come together or agree to disagree. What Joan just said really resonated with me because what the, the literature makes clear um, is that when it's just a, an open debate and anything goes, truth loses. Uh, you, you cannot give a platform to disinformation. You know, yes, there are techniques to mitigate disinformation once it's out there, but the very best thing is not to let the disinformation get out there in the first place. Lee, when I asked the question of what is the benefit of a shared reality, and you said maybe we would have fewer COVID deaths, I wanted to hear the rest of it, but let me just put that to you. What is, what is the benefit of a, of a shared reality? There's a benefit to a shared reality if the shared reality is true. If it's not true, then you can run into real difficulties. But the benefit of a shared reality, if it's true, is that we actually know what things work and what things don't, and we can, things are not chaotic. We can design social policy that actually makes people's lives better. Um, you know, I think of the things that people lie about in politics, like whether the crime rate is going up or down, 
Well, you know, if you don't actually know whether the crime rate is going up or down, how do you know how much money to spend on policing? How do you know whether you should build a prison or not? So if there's no objective reality or, you know, you think that they're just competing narratives about whether the crime rate is going up or down, you're, you're at risk of wasting tremendous amounts of money and, you know, human capital as well on a problem that doesn't exist. And so the, the benefit of a shared reality is efficiency, better living, just, you know, being able to enjoy all of the benefits of, of truth. And, and if you think about it, there are many, many benefits to believing true things. That's why science is so valued uh, around the world, why it led to the technology that we enjoy every day. Without that, if, you know, if we're just going on what we wish were true, I think we're in real trouble. We are in real trouble. Well, I think we'll let Lee have the last word there. I would like to thank all of our guests for this extremely interesting discussion. Yes, thank you all for a fascinating discussion. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our participants in this discussion. And they were Joan Donovan, who is Research Director of the Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Also, Lee McIntyre, a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and the author of the book, Post Truth. And finally, Steve Hassan, a mental health counselor who writes about his experience as a former member of the Unification Church, and he's the author of The Cult of Trump. So, Seth, what is the big picture about disinformation and lies? It's an enormous topic. We did our best to cover some of the angles here today. What was your take? The, the comment that shared reality is necessary if you want to avoid chaos. Just imagine if we didn't have shared reality on the streets and highways of the world, right? We have to have a shared reality. But the other thing that struck me is that, you know, this is a science show. I'm a scientist. And in science, you can have any idea you want. You're allowed to have any idea, any theory, preconception, belief you want. But you'll only get someone else's ear if you have observations, measurements, data to back it up evidence. And so I find it really disheartening when people don't care about evidence, because in science, that's what counts. Well, thanks to the talented team that make up our reality, senior producer Gary Dieterhoff and assistant producer Sarah Derwin. I am the executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization that investigates, among other things, the mechanisms and prevalence of biology. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Chostek. Also, big thanks to our listeners and our Patreon supporters. Special thanks to some of our Patreon velociraptors, Beth in Washington, D.C., David Lant, and Noah and Katie Schwartz. This episode of Big Picture Science is one of our regular looks at critical thinking, and it's called Skeptic Check, Shared Reality. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to the guests you've heard. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.